Grab your cactus juice and place your bets. In Avatar The Last Airbender and Legend of Korra, we meet tons of capable benders, but we're shown that they all have wildly varying power levels. Where does everyone stack up? Hey guys, I'm Chris Carr. Let's rank all the benders in the world of Avatar. Before we dive in, I want to give a big ol' shout out to our super nerd sponsor of the day, Logan Clad. Thanks to heroes like Logan, we get to keep talking tunes with y'all. So thank you so much. If you want to pitch in, head on over to our Patreon page and see if a donation tier works for you. Well, thank you with shout outs, patches, and behind the scenes looks. Okay, so if you're making this list, who are the most powerful benders in Avatar? Oh, uh, it's so easy. Jake Sully. I hate you. Okay, sorry. Sigourney Weaver. Whitney, I'm hanging up. No I, way! You're so rude. God. No! If you're looking for some sweet Avatar merch to wear while you revisit the series, then click the link to Tee Public in this video's description. They have tons to choose from. Okay, let's establish some ground rules. For the purposes of this video, we're focusing on characters that originated in these two primary series, not the comics. Though we will be citing the comic to contextualize certain characters and their feats. We'll also be grouping some folks together, noting who's a standout within those groups. Obviously, we don't want to waste our time breaking down each individual soldier of the Dai Li. We're also glossing over a few folks here and there. Uh, healers who don't fight, and characters that show no quantifiable level of bending on screen. Like that canyon guide who's like, ah, my leg! And then GTFOs. Or Fire Lord Izumi, who we simply just assume can bend. The rankings are developed based on multiple factors. Raw power is a big one, but a dexterous mastery of technique is also important, as is a character's potential to use rare subforms of bending, such as blood bending or metal bending. Sometimes characters who have bested others in battle will rank lower, but it's important to remember that exploiting a weakness or getting a lucky shot off doesn't necessarily mean the winner of the fight is more powerful. Think Mako versus Mingwa. Mingwa has a unique mastery of water, but is beaten thanks to good old Pokemon-type weaknesses. We'll be including power-ups like the Avatar state in this list. This is mostly because it's impossible to gauge certain characters without their power-ups, as they do little or no bending on screen without them. Obviously, these rulings leave some room for debate, so feel free to add your two cents in the comments. Just please be respectful of your fellow Avatar fans. Okay, let's start out with our weakest benders. 65. Bending Students Clearly, kids at the various bending academies, like the Water Bending Students and the Earth Bending Academy kids, are going to be on the lowest rung, as they're just learning the basics of bending. 64. Two and other relatives. When Mako and Bolin meet the rest of their family, they learn that some of them, like Cousin Two, are also benders. However, due to making ends meet, they haven't had the same opportunities to explore their power like the boys have had in Republic City as pro benders. 63. The Fire Circus. The Fire Circus workers clearly know how to bend, but they also use their abilities to abuse animals and give our buddy Appa severe PTSD. A fire whip, while deadly and damaging, certainly isn't the most impressive bending we've seen in the series. Also, that guy's just a douche. Number 62 and 61. Coming in neck and neck are Wacky Wushu, the waterbending entertainer, and Malu, the firebending magician. They definitely showed us some cool bending skills, but I'm not sure how handy their performance art would be in a battle. I'm saying that Wacky Wushu is the higher ranking guy here because he's branded himself, and that is a key thing to do in entertainment work. Number 60, Haru. After his father's imprisonment, Haru was forbidden from earthbending, but would practice in secret. While he did maintain some level of skill, without guidance and regular practice, Haru just wasn't as strong as other earthbenders we saw in the series. That being said, he levels up as the last airbender plays out. Probably drawing power from that sweet, sweet mustache. Number 59, Gao. The earthbending bully we meet in Zuko alone isn't that powerful. He's intimidating, and preying on the weaknesses of others isn't strength. Zuko easily takes this bender out and puts him in his place. Number 58, New Air Nomads. The New Air Nomads did have varying power levels, but like the young students we mentioned at the top of this list, they were still learning. Ryu, who lived in his mom's basement, was definitely on the weaker side. Otaku, the air acolyte, had the leg up on knowledge of the customs of Air Nomads. And Opal and Kai really leveled up their powers. Boomy learns to hold his own as well, but his military know-how is still his strongest attribute. Number 57, the Earthbending Wrestlers. That means the Gecko, the Gopher, the Headhunter, Fire Nation Man, the Big Bad Hippo, and of course, the Boulder. These jabronis can bend, but it's just like when we look at real life wrestlers. Could they actually fight? They're all taken down by Toph, who is arguably one of the strongest benders we've seen. And we'll get to her, don't you worry. But the optics of having your collective butts handed to you by the blind bandit, ooh, not great guys. Number 56, Master Yu. 
Sure, Master Yu had a bending academy, but the guy seemed like a real hack. He couldn't fathom that Toph could be a capable bender, let alone the powerhouse she was. And he was all about that cash. He even turned to bounty hunting with those yahoos from Earth WrestleMania. I'm not convinced this guy is a true earthbending master. Number 55, Milo. Well, fart bending is awesome. Milo has a lot to learn about mastering airbending, like discipline and basic hygiene. He'll get there. He's already taken down some real bad baddies. Number 54, Iki. Same sort of situation when it comes to Iki. She's definitely going to grow up to be a strong bender and her family underestimates her, but Iki has her own way of doing things. Much like her grandfather, she'd rather make a friend and come at a problem creatively. I think that's a strength. Number 53, Kaya. While Kaya is a brilliant healer with bending in her blood, she isn't one of the stronger fighters we see in the Avatar world. Maybe I'm just holding her to the impossibly high standard of fighting like Katara, but Kaya was raised in a time of peace and just doesn't seem to have the raw power that her mother had. Number 52, Long Feng. Ugh, I hate this guy. Long Feng is such a creep. While he's a capable bender, he has the Dai Li do all of his bending and all of his dirty work. Sure, he's pulling the strings in the Earth Kingdom, but if we're talking about bending ability, I feel like his is super lacking. Number 51, the triple threat triad. These doofs get their butts handed to them constantly. They're obviously strong enough to push people around in Republic City, but they're bested by the Equalists and Team Avatar. Scoochie the Messenger Earthbender is surely the weakest member, while Two-Toed Ping, Viper, Mushi, and Shady Shin are the stronger players. Their leader, Lightning Bolt Zolt, appears to be the kingpin due to his bending prowess, and is theoretically the most powerful of the bunch. Number 50, Earth Kingdom Prisoners. The Earth Kingdom Prisoners, once motivated, do come together to prove they're a force to be reckoned with. Tyru, Haru's dad, is definitely a standout, as he, and his son with more training, help fight with Team Avatar against the Fire Nation. Number 49, Pro Benders. The Pro Benders were pretty tricky for me to place. Like real life pro athletes, these players have tremendous skill and have monetized that skill. That being said, it's hard to determine how they do in an actual battle. And it certainly doesn't help that most of them are filthy cheats who bribe the refs and fight dirty. Number 48, Sandbenders. Sandbending is notoriously difficult. The people of the Siwang Desert are named for this specific style of earthbending, working with sand rather than solid earth. The tribes have adapted to their hostile environment, living as nomads, raiders, and scavengers. Number 47, Swamp Benders. The Swamp Benders get major points for ingenuity and adaptability as well. Using the water inside plants to manipulate them is genius, and a lot less ooky than manipulating the blood in living things. Maybe I just have a soft spot for these yokels, as I am so very confident I would be a foggy Swamp Bender. Number 46, Sun Warriors. The Sun Warriors are the original firebenders, who learned of this practice from dragons. Their philosophy differs wildly from the Fire Nation, as they mostly focus on the life-giving aspects of fire. They developed all of the original firebending moves, such as the Dancing Dragon. Number 45, Republic City Police Metal Bending Force. Founded by Toph Beifong, the Metal Bending Police team Spider-Mans its way through the city on metal cables they keep on hand. This squad is made up of gifted benders who have mastered metal bending. Number 44, the Metal Clan. I placed the Metal Clan above the police force simply because the clan was constantly innovating the bending form. And the only way to make something more powerful is through dedicated practice and pushing and expanding boundaries. Number 43, the Dai Li. The secret police force within Ba Sing Se, the Dai Li capture and brainwash those outspoken against the city. Founded by Avatar Kyoshi, this elite squad was supposed to protect the cultural heritage of Ba Sing Se, placing the Earth Kingdom's interests, or as we see, Long Fei's interests, above the people's. All of the members, though, are strong fighters with tremendous bending ability. Number 42, the Earth Kingdom Generals. Like a lot of our other groupings, the Earth Kingdom Generals vary wildly in skill, but we're gonna average them all together. While all the Generals were capable of bending, and some worked with Team Avatar, you had others who skated by as ineffective and incompetent leaders, such as General Sung, or people like Fong, who tried to weaponize Aang for the Earth Nation's personal gain. Number 41, Fire Nation Generals. Most of the generals we meet in Avatar The Last Airbender honestly kind of suck. We assume they have high bending abilities, since that seems to be a standard requirement of joining the Fire Nation forces, but we don't see them bend much, aside from participating in Agni Kai's with a teenager. Standout losers are Yanra, the southern raider who killed Katara's mom, and General Zhao. Zhao. Who murders a fish. Ugh, what a turd. Numbers 39 and 40, Denza and Eska. Unalak's kids are mighty creepy but they pack a punch. 
the Shifty Twins can hold their own in battle. While these two initially were blindly loyal to their father, they switched to Team Avatar when they realized he had gone off the deep end and there was no coming back. The twins are very powerful, nimble, and downright terrifying. I'm giving the higher spot to Eska, though, because that chick is horrifying post-breakup. Number 38, Mako. Maybe you think Mako should be higher up on this list. Why? Because he's a hero in Korra? Yeah, but his greater asset is his detective work and tenacity. Because he's a lightning bender? Sure, higher in the list we'll see some Avatar The Last Airbender characters, who all note lightning bending as reasoning for their high rank. But in Korra, lightning bending has become old hat. It's now a blue-collar skill used to power a city. And while this is a fantastic development that allows Republic City to use electricity, it does sort of negate how special this subset of firebending is perceived. Mako can hold his own in battle and is great on the pro-bending circuit, but I don't think he's as strong as other members of Team Avatar, or some of their foes. Number 37. Air Nomads with Mastery Tattoos In the flashbacks to Aang's time with the Air Nomads, we see many monks who are marked with tattoos indicating they've mastered airbending. We can only assume their bending level, but knowing what goes into obtaining these tats, I think it's safe to say they're pretty dang strong. Number 36. Tonrock This waterbending master and father of the Avatar relies more on his own strength to overpower opponents, showcasing a more aggressive style of waterbending than we've seen from similarly skilled benders. He has quick reflexes and was even able to hold his own against Zaheer for a spell, before ultimately being overpowered. Number 35. General Iroh, Zuko's grandson Zuko's grandson is a firebending master and military leader who, despite losing his own fleet, fought in the battle for Republic City. He is able to propel himself through the air through his firebending and strong enough to take down multiple airships on his own. He's also quick to learn and adapt, as we see from him quickly figuring out how to pilot an equalist biplane. Number 34. Bolin I love that Bolin started out as our Sokka comic relief character who could bend, struggled with mastering subsets like metal, then boom, he bends lava! This is a very hard subset to master, and something we've only seen the Avatar and a Red Lotus member perform successfully. Way to go, Bolin. Number 33, Combustion Man. All right, here's one where I may lose y'all. I know, I know he's the go-to assassin in the Avatar world, but I personally think Combustion Man isn't that strong compared to a lot of our other benders, or the baddies the kids go up against. Sure, Sparky Sparky Boom Man can shoot out of his eye tattoo, but he almost always misses. He misses a bunch of children. This assassin is basically a stormtrooper. Yeah, he's got a blaster, but he ain't gonna hit the mark. I'll give you that with some practice and precision, this guy could be wicked deadly. But he blew off his own arm and leg. I know kids back home who did that with Roman candles. Just saying. Number 32, Hama. The OG bloodbender, Hama created this sinister subset of waterbending after being imprisoned by the Fire Nation. Desperate times call for desperate measures. However, Hama took pleasure in causing others harm and continued to bloodbend for her own enjoyment every full moon. Number 31, Tarlock. While Tarlock surpassed Hama's bloodbending abilities, he was nowhere near the power level of his brother or his father. He definitely has the gift of gab, though, and is well-suited as a politician. His waterbending skills are quite good as well, as we can see with his fight with Korra. Number 30, Zuko. Look, if we're talking sword and combat skills, there are few fighters who can hold a candle to Zuko. But as a bender, he's great, but not unmatched. He himself has admitted he isn't as strong as other benders. And, as his uncle points out, he often allows his emotions to rule his bending abilities. Once he deals with his own trauma and inner turmoil, though, Zuko is finally able to redirect lightning and have a better grasp as a firebender, so much so that he actually proves to be a good instructor for Aang and a competent match for his sister. In his old age, Zuko is still a capable fighter and is able to keep pace with the Red Lotus when they ambush. Number 29, Gazan. This is the first non-Avatar we ever see bend lava! Fun fact, his lava bending moves are based on Baji Chen, a Chinese martial art that uses explosive elbow and shoulder strikes. Gazan is the weakest link of the Red Lotus, but that's not a knock against him. His colleagues just either have a heck of a lot more firepower or way more finesse technique. Number 28, Paku. Sure, he started out as an arrogant misogynist, but we grew to love Paku! This waterbending master and member of the White Lotus was clearly gifted, and opening his mind up and not restricting bending practices only aided in his personal practice. Number 27, Yakone. The gangster Yakone brought bloodbending to a whole new level. Just when he thought bloodbending couldn't get creepier, he brings you psychic bloodbending. With a mere twitch of his eye, he could take down the strongest benders. 
It's a good thing Avatar Aang was able to enter the Avatar state and remove his bending. Number 26. Pali. This firebending criminal also had that oh-so-rare ability to combustion bend. Anne was using it to overthrow governments and appease her boyfriends here. Combustion Babe definitely had one of the more grisly deaths in the Avatar universe. Sui and Beifong metal bent a chest plate around Pali's head, leading one of her combustion attacks to explode in that confined space. Yeesh. Number 25. Zhang Zhang. Making this list, I've realized I hold firebenders who practice restraint in incredibly high regard. We see how dangerous firebending can be constantly, so practitioners who exercise caution and care are definitely stronger. Take the deserter Zhang Zhang. This guy is immensely powerful, but decides to no longer align himself with the Fire Nation or their practices. Seeing him unleash his power along with the rest of the White Lotus was epic, especially as he was power enhanced by Sozin's Comet. Number 24. Lin Beifong. The Republic City Police Chief is a badass. She's got a chip on her shoulder and definitely feels the weight of living in her mother's shadow. But Lin Beifong is a powerful, no BS lady. She can bend earth, metal, and use seismic sense. Lin has proven herself to be a one-woman army on multiple occasions, so it's no surprise that Republic City's safety rests in her hands. Number 23. Amon. Amon was hands down the most powerful bloodbender we saw. He was a total natural who could bloodbend without a full moon and break his brother's bloodbending hold effortlessly. Surpassing his father's skill level, Amon could subdue multiple benders at once, remove their bending ability, and had excellent hand-to-hand -hand combat skills. All this, plus his charisma as a leader and his ability to vilify benders, this guy is still my favorite villain in the entire series. Number 22, Su Yin Beifong. She's a dancer, leader, mother of five, and bending master. Su establishes the Metal Clan city of Zaofu, where the limits of bending are constantly pushed. Like a mother and half-sister, she's mastered traditional and metal bending, and can shift seamlessly from one to the other. She also utilizes seismic sense, the technique developed by Toph. Her artistic practice with metal and out-of-the-box thinking gives her the finesse to have a leg up on her sister. Number 21, Tenzin. Tenzin has an immense weight on his shoulders raising the next generation of airbenders and living up to his avatar father's legacy. As the sole airbending child Aang sired, that's a lot to live up to. While Tenzin is extremely knowledgeable of the customs and cultures of the Air Nation, he has difficulty connecting to the spirit world, something that came easily to his father and comes easily to his daughter. He's in excellent physical shape and is an agile fighter who is constantly creating new airbending techniques. He also was able to stay conscious for a long time during that whooping from the Red Lotus. Look, a weaker person would not have survived that. Number 20, Monk Gyatso. Though known for his sense of humor and kind heart, this monk was a strong airbender tasked with training two avatars. According to Aang, Gyatso was the greatest airbender in the world. It stands to reason that Gyatso would have similar power levels as Tenzin. Number 19, Mingwa. She can bend without arms. She can make arms. She can make terrifying arm tentacles. Ah! Think of how much waterbending comes from specific fluid motions from arms and hands. And then here's Mingwa, adapting and creating limbs that she can maneuver with an insane amount of control. Like how she can free segments of those tendrils or use them to support her entire body weight. Honestly, if this girl had access to bloodbending, she'd easily be a top 10 bender. Number 18, Jinora. The eldest of Tenzin's children, Jinora has a natural affinity with spirits, surpassing her father's ability. She's one of the few people capable of communicating with spirits in the physical world, and thus becomes Korra's guide in the spirit world. By the end of the series, she's earned her stripes and is an airbending master in her own right. Number 17, Kuvira. The so-called Great Uniter, Kuvira was an earthbending and metalbending master who was mentored by Su Yin Beifong. Thanks to Su's dance training, Kuvira was an agile and acrobatic fighter who could evade attacks without overexerting herself through wasteful movements. On top of her physical strength, She's an extremely persuasive speaker and incredibly intimidating, as we see from her strong arming the Earth Kingdom people to pledge their allegiance to her. Number 16, Katara. Katara is, in my opinion, the linchpin of the original Team Avatar. Without her, I don't know if Aang would have ever been able to fulfill his destiny. Driven by a strong moral compass and packing raw, natural talent for bending, Katara essentially taught herself how to bend, helped train the Avatar and became the first female allowed to be taught combat bending by proving her worth against Paku. She is a brilliant healer as well, and has the ability to bloodbend. Thanks to her creative thinking, she bests Azula and goes on to train the next avatar. Number 15, Azula. 
The princess of the Fire Nation was a loose cannon, y'all. A firebending prodigy, she was sadistic, cruel, and incredibly manipulative. While she had a keen mind for strategy and power plays, she lacked basic social skills. This is due in large part to her belief that her mother hated her, which slowly manifested into Azula growing more and more mentally unstable. She placed pressure on herself to be perfect in her father's eyes so she'd at least have his love and respect. When she's defeated by her brother Zuko and Katara, she's a complete mental breakdown. Number 14, Avatar Kurik. I know on principle the Avatar should be at the top of this list since they can access more power. However, both series show us that someone who's mastered one bending art can be far more effective than an Avatar. Take for example Kurik, the Avatar during a time of peace, who thanks to the actions of the previous Avatar, never had to push his bending abilities. While Kurik was obviously a great bender, he was much more relaxed than the other Avatars we've seen, with a go-with-the-flow surfer bro vibe, and didn't really ever have to flex his abilities. He acted pretty big for his britches, and could be pompous. His arrogance led Ko the Face Stealer to swiping the face of his fiance Umi to punish the Avatar for his attitude. Number 13, Sozin. Oh, I'm honestly so frustrated with having to rank this character because I think he's a weak man. He allowed his friend to die over his ambition. He approved mass genocide. He's a xenophobic coward. His sheer physical strength, especially due to his comet upping his abilities, made him a legendary rival to Avatar Roku and the benchmark of power for the firebending dynasty. Numbers 11 and 12, Toph versus Boomy. Okay, I know, I know I said I wouldn't bring the comics into this, but come on, Boomy and Toph fought in the comics and it was a stalemate. In one corner, you have Toph, a child who invented metal bending, learned from the OG bending masters and uses her disability as an asset for her bending skills. Boomy, on the other hand, is over a hundred years old, can bend with his face, seems capable of bending without being connected to the earth, and he took back Amashu all by his lonesome. <sighs> you guys, I gotta give it to Boomy. I think he's got the leg up, y'all. I think the king of Umashu is the stronger bender. He face bent. That's it, Boomy at number 11, fight me. Number 10, Zaheer. Zaheer is a truly terrifying villain. The leader of the Red Lotus, Zaheer is a martial arts expert and anarchist set on destroying the Avatar. After harmonic convergence, he becomes an airbender and, having let go of his earthly tethers, unlocks the ability to fly. He's only the second person in history to ever do this. Despite just gaining this bending ability, he's extremely proficient. His natural ability may be thanks to his spiritual strength and his deep knowledge of air nomad philosophy and history, but it doesn't hurt that his extremist attitude allows him to bring air bending to sinister new heights, like creating a vacuum to suffocate the Earth Kingdom Queen. Number nine, Ozai. Fire Lord Ozai's bending and fighting is fueled by anger. His attacks are fierce and fatal. With the help of Sozin's Comet, Ozai's already astounding power level gives him such a boost he can decimate the land single-handedly. He can lightning bend as well. Now, despite his cruel demeanor, the Fire Lord, thanks to the propaganda distributed in the Fire Nation, is a respected and beloved figure, viewed as someone as close to perfection as possible. Even imprisoned, Ozai maintained a loyal following, and his ability to masterfully manipulate those around him definitely gives him an edge. Number eight, Juan. As the first avatar in the series, I put him on the weaker end here because he just didn't have access to the wisdom of those before him. While Juan initially stole from the spirits for his own gain, he developed a deep respect for them and created balance in the world. He shows us that people can grow and change and is the spark that gave us an avatar in the first place. Number seven, Unalak. Unalak, in addition to being a powerful waterbending master, was highly spiritual and could utilize a specialized form of healing with spiritual energy. He essentially could bring dark spirits back to the light and vice versa. Once Unalak fused with the great spirit Vatu, he became the avatar's counterpart, the dark avatar, the human embodiment of chaos and darkness. This merger definitely gave Unalak a power up. Ultimately, Korra was able to vanquish her uncle, but he made quite the impact. He severed Korra's connection to her past lives helped cause harmonic convergence and shift the energy of the world so much so that people became airbenders and changed Korra's perspective on the role of the Avatar. She no longer was the bridge between reality and the spirit world, but instead, she was there to help the two worlds coexist. The Vatu power-up is mostly why I'm placing Unalak higher on this list. Yes, as a waterbender, he was a force to be reckoned with, but I believe without those enhanced spirit powers, he wouldn't be such a threat. Number six, Iroh. Retired general, former crown prince of the Fire Nation, dragon of the West, tea enthusiast, uncle. Iroh has one of the most tremendous stories in all of the Avatar universe, and we mostly learn of it through legends and stories. 
He was a master firebender with an insane power level. He could redirect lightning, something he learned by studying other bending arts, and he was extremely spiritual. After his son passed, Iroh really reevaluated his life and decided who he wanted to be. And the levels of restraint and compassion he exhibits throughout the series is honestly what makes me view him as such a powerhouse. Number 5. Avatar Yangchen Don't be fooled by the monk attire. Yangchen was a stone-cold bee. She was regarded for her determination and power, and Yangchen was feared for her willingness to do whatever it took to fulfill her avatar duties and maintain balance in the world. There were no threats of war for an entire generation after her death. Number 4. Avatar Roku Roku was a wise and just avatar, with a forgiving nature and noble intentions. However, Roku allowed his relationship with his childhood friend turned Fire Lord Sozin to cloud his judgment. Sozin took a hard imperialistic turn, but Roku wouldn't give up on him. When the two tried to contain a volcanic eruption, Roku used his airbending abilities to protect Sozin. When it came time for Sozin to help in return, though, Sozin let his friend die, realizing he could finally fulfill his grand plans for the Fire Nation. His downfall, he claims, was his lack of decisiveness. Number 3. Avatar Kiyoshi Let's talk about the longest living avatar, Avatar Kiyoshi! This lady lived to be 230! 230! Damn, Kiyoshi! While Roku and Aang believed they needed to exhaust all options before resorting to violence, Avatar Kiyoshi had no problem killing her enemies. She was going to do her avatar duties by any means necessary. While she was an extremely effective avatar who took down the problematic Chin the Conqueror, founded the Kiyoshi Warriors, and kept the Earth Kingdom safe, she also led to the foundation of the Dai Li, who, as we know, led to the corruption and downfall of the Earth Kingdom. If you haven't read the Kiyoshi book, what are you doing? Get on it. Let me know if you guys want a Kiyoshi deep dive. I want a Kiyoshi deep dive. Number 2. Avatar Aang Aang is by far my favorite character, and he had the odds stacked against him. Emerging from the ice, learning all of his people were murdered and he's the last airbender alive. And on top of all that, he's the avatar who's expected to take on a full-grown adult Fire Lord? Despite this incredible burden, Aang remained fun-loving and hopeful and stuck to his roots as a monk in that he wanted to respect all living things. He was insanely spiritually aware and connected, and was open to creative problem solving, and eager to learn from others. His ability to make friends from all walks of life helped him unite the nations, not exactly an easy feat. In his avatar state, Aang is a force of nature that precisely uses each element to subdue the threat of the raging Ozai. Instead of squashing the Fire Lord like a bug, he harnesses the power of energy bending to strip him of his powers. Energy bending requires an unbendable spirit, and it speaks volumes to his strength that little free-loving Aang is able to bend a tyrant to his will. And finally, number one, Avatar Korra. Oh my gosh, I can hear part of the internet already screaming at me. Oh, okay, but let's just look at the data, y'all, please. If we're talking about which avatar I prefer, hands down, it's Aang. I love that guy. But if we're talking power, I've gotta give it to Korra. She excelled at hand-to-hand -hand combat, She's the first avatar to metal bend, and she could also bend energy. Aang figured out how to bend energy within, but we saw Korra take a direct hit from that spirit vine powered cannon and bend that raw power. In addition to the knowledge of all the avatars before her, including Aang's wisdom, Korra had more time than Aang to master her bending abilities, since she wasn't on a timeline thanks to impending doom. She showed a raw talent and aptitude for three of the four elements at an extremely early age, and she had the time the teachers to really help her hone those skills. Korra's innate competitive nature also drives her to reach her potential, while Aang is more laid back when it comes to his training. Korra is also shown to have the ability to enter the Avatar state with ease, while Aang struggles. Had Ozai not tossed Aang into a jagged rock to unblock his chakra, he would have never entered the Avatar state to defeat him. On top of this, Korra had her powers handicapped multiple times in order for her villains to have a shot at beating her. Even with Korra's bending severed by Amon, or her body poisoned by the Red Lotus, she's still able to defeat notably high-powered threats. Yes, Avatar Aang squared up against Azula and Ozai, but Korra took on the strongest psychic bloodbender, a tyrannical family member channeling the strength of a literal chaos god. The second dude to ever unlock the power of flight who trained specifically to murder her! And a metal-bending master with death ray mechas. These antagonists weren't supercharged by a comet, but they did rely on underhanded tactics or outside forces to even have a chance at besting her. And they all still lost. There is an argument to be made that once Korra severs her connections to her past incarnations, Aang gets the edge on her. 
And that's a totally fair argument. But even this position would concede that Korra at her peak out Avatar's Aang at his. So those are my rankings for every bender in the Avatar universe. But I'm sure you don't agree with all of my choices. So let me know in the comments where you think these benders rank. And remember, we're talking about a cartoon that's about unifying folks, so let's be respectful, even when we have our differences in opinions. If you like what you heard here, please subscribe and hit the bell so we can keep the conversation going. And let me know what Avatar content you want. Thanks again to all of our donors on Patreon, to Tia Public, and all of you amazing Avatar fans. For more videos, click to the left. Thanks for watching. See you, Space Cowboy.